everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today for the Healthy Native Youth Community of Practice. Uh, it is the very last one of the calendar year. So um, this is uh, doubly exciting. My name is Michelle Singer. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation. Yat Ehebene to all those Navajos out there. Um, I am not your normal facilitator for community of practice, although I am the project manager, but the lovely Amanda Gaston um, was not able to be with us at this time, um, traveling for the holidays. She is missed, but I am going to do my best to be able to be your host today for the community of practice. Today, we have a good one. It is the first of the part two series of the community of practice, and it is the Safe Spaces 101 series like to give a land acknowledgement. I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon, which is the uh, traditional homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala bands of the Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, as well as many indigenous nations along the Willamette and Columbia rivers. So as we know, we like to start things out in a good way and set intention here. And I'm very happy and proud to have um, Taylor Dean, uh, be able to open us up in a good way. Taylor? Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Taylor Dean. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm a citizen of the Puyallup Nation. And I'm going to start us off with a blessing. Uh, everybody feel free to close your eyes um, and do whatever works best for you. Um, creator, thank you for this beautiful day you have given us. Thank you for bringing us all together under the goal of creating safe spaces for the youth in our communities. I know that it can be a very difficult time during the holidays, so I pray that you give us all strength to not only take care of ourselves, but also lift up those around us. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taylor. My hands up to you. <laughs> Thank you. What a good way to start out our day and with intention of this discussion around a topic that is very important to our youth and to our communities and to one another. I'm very excited to introduce our uh, speaker today, um, uh, Nicole Trevino, I'm going to turn it over to her to be able to uh, introduce herself and is a dear, dear friend of the Healthy Native Youth Project and the Adolescent Health Team at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. So Nicole, would you uh, uh, introduce yourself, please? Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Trevino and uh, excited to be here uh, today to talk a little bit about safe spaces and um, just share a little bit um, of some of my thoughts, but also to hear some of the great uh, wisdom from our group uh, that we have coming in from uh, from all over. Um, so I am in Austin, Texas. I work with the Healthy Native Youth Team at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. I use she or they pronouns, and um, I'm reminded that we are sort of at the end of the year, and one of the things I love the most at this time of year is spending time with my family and uh, getting to do that a little more than we normally do. I'll hand over uh, back to Michelle. Oh, Nicole. Yes. Uh, really, really lovely to have you here today. Thank you again so much. Nicole is just such a dedicated uh, um, and passionate and motivated individual to help to raise healthy Native youth, but all youth. So we're just very honored to have her here with us today. So I uh, wanted to let you know that we have a, a variety of different um, icons throughout the presentation. And you'll see here, they're so darn cute. You'll see the, the little elders here, which are, um, you know, words of wisdom, some tips. We also have the little cedar hat um, in addition to the um, corn which is uh, uh, areas for inclusion. And then we have the cute little uh, shaker, which is a time for us to share um, or a tip or a tool. So just wanna make sure that you are aware as we go through these slides, you'll see uh, different images um, throughout. Also too, we love to engage with you all. 
we really want to make this an interactive activity. So we will have a Mentimeter activity here just in a few moments. Uh, I encourage you to use the chat box. That's um, always a fun place to hang out and, and kind of exchange ideas and thoughts. And then also too, um, we will have opportunities to share along the way uh, for whatever your comfort is. But without that being said, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'd love and we love to know who's with us. And so please take a moment at this time to type in your name, your pronouns, your tribe or organization. Where are you joining us from? And then what are you hoping to learn today? And if you'd be so kind and would like to put your email address in there, we'd love to stay connected with you and let you know kind of what's happening, um, not only with the community of practice, but also with healthy Native youth. So I'll just um, have you all take a few moments to go ahead and put that information in there. We've already seen that Janine is here and Hannah and other folks. So love to see you all. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So what we also have here are uh, group agreements and digital learning agreements um, that we always like to share and be able to let folks know a little bit about um, coming together to share some resources and reinforce the importance of creating safe spaces with youth before we can talk about sensitive health programming topics. And these are two activities and two tools that are readily available on the Healthy Native Youth website. Uh, well, the one on the left is a group agreement uh, example that uh, is downloaded from the Native Stand 2.0. It just sets a good stage for folks coming together and uh, making sure we're all of one mind as you move forward in discussions. And then on the right, this has been very popular. It's very good, especially uh, amongst families or at home or if you're working with uh, or engaging youth is a digital learning agreement. Um, this is a really great way to come together and to make sure that, um, you know, again, creating a safe space so that we really are present and that we're able to really be in the moment and learn together and setting some boundaries, especially around technology. A great tool, especially during this holiday season. Hint, hint. So, all righty. So, we've got goals today and Safe Spaces 101. We want you to be able to, after the conclusion of this session, is to be able to describe the components of a positive learning environment, uh, to be able to develop an agenda for a youth program session, which Nicole has a template, an example to share with you today. So you'll see that. And to identify strategies for helping youth select boundaries for themselves. And so I think you're going to have a really wonderful time hearing from Nicole, who uh, has some wonderful tools and resources to be able to share with you all. And so again, just like to give you a quick little visual roadmap of where we're going today, talking about physically uh, and emotionally safe learning environments. What is that? We hear these words, safe spaces and safe learning. And what does that mean? Educator characteristics and classroom management. We'll start going into structuring youth programming and youth characteristics, which we get a lot of requests about. Like, what can we do? What does that look like? Where do we start? Helping youth set some healthy boundaries. And then we'll have an opportunity to like, let's talk. Let's let's get into some of this action here. And, and then we'll close it up. So I always welcome, uh, and we do as well, the Healthy Native Youth team. Um, your comments, your feedback, and then certainly um, uh, when appropriate, we'll have folks unmute and just let us know what you're thinking. So we are going to go ahead and start out with a Mentimeter Q&A. We would like to have you use the link in the chat box. I believe Taylor is going to drop a link that you can just click on and you can, um, it'll come up to a Mentimeter page. What we'd like to know is what words describe a time when you were in a space that had a good vibe, good vibrations, had a good feel, positive kind of aura about it. Um, please uh, go ahead and uh, click on that link. I don't know, Taylor, did you by chance put that in there? Give me one. Okay. And we'll go to that.
Thank you for your patience. We have little technical difficulties here. So what words, and I believe on this Mentimeter, I will showcase the actual page here. Were you able to get that into the, there we go. Yeah. yeah. So folks just go ahead and click on that and you can see the screen. Let me see. So as you see here, I love this. Look at this peeps. You guys are throwing out some great words here. You're throwing out uh, what words describe a time when you were in a space that had a good vibe, welcoming, warm, humor. Oh my goodness. That's so important. Inclusive in my yoga studio, practice yoga and teaching my yoga students. Love that. Non-judgmental. Yes. Welcoming and inviting warm. There's that word again, community, homey, <laughs> comfortable, laughter, welcoming, uh, cozy. Let's see here. Oops. What did I do there? Sorry about that, friends. Let me go back. Okay. Well, I think. Stop sharing. <laughs> That's a great start. How did that feel to you, Nicole? I think you're really seeing. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I think we're seeing a lot of the uh, words of warmth, cozy, homey, safe. So. Why don't we go ahead and kick it over to you? Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. And thank you, everyone, for participating in that. Um, it's You saw a lot of words that were sort of homey, welcoming, inviting. Um, and I'm always reminded of something uh, someone said to me, a colleague said to me, um, about how we create a, a space that's welcoming to all. Uh, he said, if um, it's not enough for you to give me an invite to the party at your house, when I get there, is there going to be music I like to listen to, food that I like to eat, um, people that I know, or is it all going to be sort of uh, the music you've picked out and the food that you normally uh, eat and the people that you know that I may not know? Um, because there's a, a difference, right, between just offering the invitation and cultivating a space that feels uh, welcoming, that feels uh, like uh, it's meant for you to be there. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit today about how, how we do that. But some of the things that that come to mind for me um, about what creates a positive learning environment or a good vibe in our youth programs um, are things like the physical space, right? Is it uh, when I get uh, in the room, is it uh, loaded with posters and all types of things so much so that I can't focus on any one thing? Or does it feel comfortable? Are there places to sit that are, are you know, um, places that feel comfortable to my body, right? Um, and uh, then the other thing I, that comes to mind for me is the emotional space. And that's kind of the the feel of the room. If you've ever walked into the middle of a, a tense conversation where you can feel that tension, even though you don't know what was being discussed or um, what, what was happening before you got there, um, the feel of a space and of a conversation or of um, uh, interaction with folks is, is a really kind of intangible, but also uh, tangible kind of place uh, that we might find ourselves in. How do we cultivate a space that feels welcoming to others? And then there's the other piece of the people in the room, right? The educator and what they bring to, uh, to the environment, the youth program leader and what they bring, um, as well as the young people themselves, the, um, you know, how they're feeling from any uh, one day to the next, um, as well as um, how they interact with each other. And so the dynamic of these four things working together really create um, an environment that um, our youth programs are 
um, you know, um, that exhibiting in one way or another. And um, sometimes when one thing is off, it can really throw the whole balance off. Um, so we try our best uh, each day and, and in every program session uh, that we might be leading with young people to uh, create on the balance or on the whole um, a good, good balance of these things uh, to try to cultivate a space uh, that feels welcoming, inviting, and safe and inclusive for young people to participate in. We'll go to the next slide. So we'll start with the um, safe physical spaces, right? Um, one of the things that's really beneficial um, is spaces for self-care. We know that young people, especially since the COVID pandemic started, uh, they're really dealing with a lot, right? There's a lot that's happened in the last few years that's been particularly hard on, on young people. Uh, so, uh, and in any given day, we all remember being teenagers, right? Your, your boyfriend or girlfriend or partner breaks up with you. Um, and yeah, you're not gonna have your best day that day, right? Um, so there may be in any, uh, at any time, um, a point at which uh, individual young person or uh, the full group of young people might need some space for self-care. Um, so what might that look like? Maybe it looks like a, um, you know, cultural things that they can engage in that help nourish them or um, complete them in a, in a way, uh, remind them of who they are. Um, maybe it's a space to take a time out and put some headphones on and just take the day to kind of focus on their own well-being, their own mental health, um, and what they need in order to show up the next day and, and be in a better uh, headspace or be in a better place. Um, sometimes it's also a sensory friendly space, right? I mentioned kind of being overwhelmed by uh, lots of posters and things in an environment. That's me personally, uh, but a lot of young people struggle with that, um, with there being uh, sights or sounds, uh, lights, uh, scents, um, or just the general busyness of the space that can be overwhelming for some. And in particular, youth with um, ADHD that are autistic um, or that have other um, sort of needs, maybe they have a learning disability, uh, the sensory kind of elements within the space can, um, can sometimes be overwhelming. So being mindful of how much we're adding to the space and also, um, you know, letting youth know what some of the expectations are of, uh, say, we've got a young person that's very sensitive to smells and uh, scents and things kind of discouraging um discouraging, you know, uh, cologne or perfume wearing or whatever. And then um, I also think about privacy and freedom of movement. So um, can young people actually physically get around the space and move into breakout groups um, with relative ease. If you've ever been in a high school classroom, you know how intensively uh, packed and crammed a lot of rooms um, are these days, right? Um, there's just uh, often a need to add a lot of students into a small room. And if you happen to be doing an after school program in that same room, you might have a lot less students, but still the same number of desks in the environment. And so thinking about uh, ways that uh, you can kind of structure the physical space to um, allow for freedom of movement, um, as well as requesting spaces for your program that are private. Um, I'm always reminded of a time that I was asked to teach sex ed um, in a hallway and um, yeah, it's hard to have a conversation about topics that might be challenging for youth to talk about or to openly uh, share about if they don't have privacy, if anyone walking by um, could hear them and, and share their business um, with the entire school or with the entire you know, youth program community. And then the welcoming piece, right? Um, I often think about the if we're able to create a space from scratch, say in a boys and girls club or after school environment, um, the furniture that we select, um, having 
cozy kind of spots to sit uh, can be really beneficial to a group dynamic. How we arrange the furniture uh, can be important as well. The signage that we have, um, you know, on the walls, uh, the comfort of this space just generally, are there comfortable spots to sit? And then music and food and uh, those sorts of things are all elements of um, the physical environment that we can help shape and cultivate um, to create a physical space that feels inviting, welcoming, um, but also gives young people space to take some time out for themselves, focus on their mental well-being, um, and you know, have a, an opportunity to learn or connect with each other in a way that uh, that helps them uh, feel engaged and like they want to participate and keep coming back. But I'm curious if there's other other thoughts, feel free to share in the chat box if you like uh, other things that come to mind of um, what creates a physical space. Yeah, Michelle said the um, warm and welcoming plus culturally identifiable images uh, sends a really positive uh, message. And that's true for school environments, for uh, community-based settings, clinics, Oh, I love that, Jackie. Access to outdoor spaces. Young people often get so little time uh, to be in outdoor spaces, right, and be with their environment. Uh, so getting young people out to, um, to a, a natural space can be really nice. And then Clover says, um, our youth groups have mentioned uh, loving to be in talking circles and being outside. Yeah, um, just rearranging your your desks or your seating in a circle changes the whole dynamic from the classroom style where everyone's looking at you um, to a space where they can look at each other and connect with the, each other. Fidget toys, uh, noise canceling headphones. Thank you, Audrey. And then um, a classroom with no windows, uh, Taylor, you worked in for a year. That sounds really tough. Um, and it does make a big difference, right? The ability to look out on the horizon um, grounds you in a way. Plants and pets, yeah, really good, good notes here. And someone mentioned food as well. Um, food in, is an excellent way to add culture and uh, nourishment at the same same time. It's really hard to learn when um, when you are on an empty stomach or are running a little hungry, right? Um, so snacks and things like that can go a long way at helping uh, gain the attention and, and focus of the group. All right, let's go on to the... Um, Next slide for emotionally safe environments. So we talked a little bit about uh, group agreements and or ground rules, uh, whatever, however way you want to call it um, is okay. Uh, different people sort of frame it in different ways. Um, but group agreements are what gives us kind of the rules for how we'll interact um, as a group, right? The things that uh, shape the group dynamic or that we want to shape the group dynamic, as well as the things we might avoid. So um, an example might be we want to, you know, put our cell phones away so we can totally focus or we want to have our cell phones with us so that um, we're accessible to people who might need us, right? Um, and so uh, getting young people engaged in uh, the creation of whatever these rules are helps them have accountability um, to each other for the rules that they've agreed to collectively, um, but also in uh, having accountability for upholding the environment, the group space, um, and what, what they sort of owe to each other um, and how they want to interact with each other. Often we do group agreements, um, say in a first session, and then we don't bring them back or we don't reintegrate them um, into um, each session that follows. Um, but it's important to bring the group agreements back each session um, and always stay open to amending them as needed. Sometimes, you know, until you cover a, a topic of your program or your lesson uh, that 
maybe is a little more sensitive. Maybe the youth didn't see a need for a, a group agreement until they waded into some challenging territory and then they needed to kind of take a step back and reflect on uh, what, what else needs to be a part of the group agreements in order to feel um, like that it's a safe space for them to participate and that they can be uh, their full selves within the session. Predictability, um, predictability often um, is sort of seen as a negative, right? If someone says you're a really predictable person, you may not take that as a compliment. But when we think about young people who might be experiencing uh, trauma actively or maybe experienced trauma in the past, uh, predictability can go a long way in knowing what to expect from one day to the next. Um, it can be a, a stabilizing force um, and can be really helpful for uh, them not feeling like, oh, I'm going to walk in and I never know what, what mood Miss Nicole is going to be in today. Um, that's not the, the type of environment that um, cultivates trust and, and a safety, sense of safety for uh, young people. So knowing what to expect from you as, as their educator, as their group leader um, is really important, but also um, predictability in the structure of the day, right? Uh, knowing that when we get there, we're gonna settle in, we're gonna have snacks, we're gonna uh, catch up with each other, and then we're gonna get into the topic of the day. Um, knowing what that structure looks like um, creates a sort of a predictable container. The topic of the day can change, um, but they know the general flow of the day and, and how it's going to proceed. Uh, classroom management is a, a big piece, right? Um, that we'll touch on that in educator characteristics too, but um, the way the class is managed or the group is managed um, is really important. Um, setting some expectations um, above and beyond the youth um, generated kind of group agreements. There should also be some expectations that you as the leader or as the uh, convener of the group um, uh, brings to, to the setting as well. So, you know, um, I always tell young people that I work with, we can agree, you know, to disagree, or we can have disagreement and different perspectives, but um, we still need to respect each other. We still need to show each other um, the uh, safety and, and ability in expressing ourselves and um, having a difference of opinion. We don't all have to agree, or we don't all have to share the same perspective, um, but we will all uh, respect each other and, and be kind to each other. Um, and not let our disagreement um, uh, unravel the entire group. So um, within that as well, though, uh, sharing power with young people for um, as, as part of uh, your work together um, is really important, right? It's important that you show appreciation uh, for, for good behavior, for things that are positive kind of pro-group uh, behaviors um, without fixating too much on the things that de detract from, um, from the group environment. Addressing challenging behaviors, um, you know, as they happen. So for instance, um, if, if a group member is uh, frequently misgendering someone, the first time may have been a mistake, gently correcting and, and um, asking them to try to, um, you know, remember each other's pronouns or look to someone's name tag to see what pronouns they use um, is a really important piece, right? Um, but not giving so much air to it or overreacting uh, to the point that we uh, take away from the group dynamic or make a young person feel embarrassed because they made a mistake or ashamed uh, that they made a mistake. It's okay to make mistakes, um, but we also have to be accountable when we do make mistakes for, um, for doing better and, and trying to show each other respect. Um, the other piece uh, here is building group cohesion. So creating opportunities for young people to collaborate and connect with each other. Um, we don't want 
even an educational kind of program uh, to just be one way that we're telling you know, the group what we're learning today and we're expecting particular answers or we're um, asking them to kind of respond to us. We wanna give them opportunities um, for them to connect with each other. Um, so breaking into different uh, different styles of uh, activities and things like that, uh, that create opportunities for them to connect with each other, get to know one another, um, and uh, feel some sense of camaraderie within the group. And then uh, creating space for self-expression. Um, young people love to express themselves, right? Um, part of being an adolescent is learning each day kind of a little more about yourself and uh, growing and changing from one day to the next. And so um, creating opportunities where young people can share their art, uh, their culture, or share their perspectives um, and things like that can go a long way at creating an environment where they feel safe um, expressing themselves, talking through things, making mistakes, and um, being gently kind of invited to um, to learn from their mistakes without feeling shame or blame or, or feeling like they've been uh, harmed because they made a mistake, right? Um, so all of these things kind of can help, but I'm curious uh, in the chat if folks have uh, additional thoughts on uh, what else comes to mind of, of how you might create an emotionally safe environment. Well, Nicole, this is mm -hmm. Michelle. I um, I put on, oh, darn it, sorry guys, my little mouse is just going crazy on my end. Hyperactive um, mouse. <laughs> yeah, it is, and it keeps pushing you along, and I'm sorry about that. Um, you know, my comment uh, was how important creating this emotionally safe environment is for a positive learning experience. You know, this is a helpful start in pushing back on bullying, Mm -hmm. lifting up self-esteem and confidence for youth and, you know, really establishing kind of that peer-to-peer -peer support and advocacy for each other right from the very start. And of course, as we know, all things take time, you know, to build that relationship, but it, it instills respect, you know, over time in and out of the classroom when you set the stage here and see this growth over time. I just, I love this slide. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thanks for that, Michelle. Um, I agree. I think seeing uh, especially the dynamic from the start of a youth group um, or a, you know, a group that's focused on on learning together to seeing how they end up and the connection that they have with one another. That's exactly what that peer to peer support, you know, um, cultivates is is these bonds where they care for one another they take care of each other um but they also um protect each other and support each other and encourage each other um so i really love love that idea and then jennifer modeling boundaries is so important yeah modeling is um I always say, you know, there's like the the thing that you're there to do might be delivering a, a youth empowerment program or a youth leadership program or a sex ed program. Um, but everything you do, every interaction, every aspect of what you bring to the table, um, including including modeling healthy boundaries, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this session, is so important um, for young people's learning. All of it is kind of uh, helping them grow. Let's see. Um, yeah, Jessica, um, being someone they can talk to means being someone they can trust and that they can take time. Um, I often tell parents, you know, the the reason your young person might open up more to me than they do to you is that I'm not their mom, right? I, I don't have the same uh, level of protection that I'm, uh, that I'm uh, you know, need to exhibit of them. So if I see maybe they're making some choices that might lead to some negative things uh, for them, um, I don't have the same reaction that a parent might. And it's a really important role that we as youth leaders, um, as youth program leaders um, play is uh, being sort of a, another adult that they can reach out to, that they can ask questions, 
that they can engage with that doesn't have the same um, same sort of attributes as a parent. They need the parent uh, just as much, even more than us. But um, but you know they need us as well. The same for um, as we think about like all the aunties and uncles and people that shape um, yes. who we become. We really need that, right? We right. need all of those adults in our lives. Nicole, you're right on. And for those who may, you hear this term caring adult. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really what that is, is you're the caring adult. You're that relative, um, whether it's in blood or in community, you know, um, that surrogate parent to some degree, depending on where you're at, which is so important, you know, and it's an honor, but you know, also with that comes responsibility too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, great, great comments. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I know there's some additional comments, Nicole, in the chat feed, if you wanted to just uh, take a moment and we can take a yeah. look at those really quickly here. I know um, Josephine said, showing a good example of what you expect, being a good listener, understanding or being empathetic, also being authentic to yourself. And that's so yeah. true. Um, you know, modeling and being willing to make mistakes and take responsibilities for it. And you know, uh, just some other wonderful comments. Um, Tyra mentioned that this is a neat project. She she mentioned the Freedom Writers, where we allow you to have personal journals that are placed in secure spaces for access. Um, you know, writing is really a wonderful meditative uh, opportunity as well, too. So just really love the feedback here. Um, mm -hmm. So wonderful contributions in the chat feed. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for sharing. Um, what one of the things that we're modeling is that I may be the speaker today, right? But um, all of you have so much experience to share with one another that um, it's really beneficial to see, uh, you know, that you all have the space to share some of the good ideas and good wisdom that you've gained in, in your work um, as well. So let's go on to the next uh, next topic, educator characteristics and classroom management. Um, classroom management um, is, is uh, <laughs> such an important uh, skill and same for group management, facilitation skills. We could sort of uh, frame that in a lot of different ways, but classroom management is one of the ways that, that we frame um, how we, how we uh, manage um, our, our room, our space, and, and the vibe in our uh, youth programs, right? Um, so classroom management, um, we'll talk a little bit and we'll share some tips in a, in a moment of uh, things that, that come to mind. But an educator's ability, um, a skill uh, within classroom management and facilitation skills and things like that really go a long way at um, shaping the dynamic of a group. Um, you know, if you if you ever observe educators or youth group leaders, and I do this frequently, um, there's a big difference between someone who's doing it for the first time, who might uh, be a little nervous or have a, a little bit of um, self-confidence challenge because it's their first time doing it, um, to the veteran, and many of you on this call are, are veterans um, it, as educators and youth group leaders. Um, so a lot of that just comes with time, right? We we build our skill the more we do something. Um, but, you know, if you observe someone who has maybe a little more experience than yourself and you think, why can't I do that? I was trying to do that and I just didn't do it quite well. Um, that's okay. That It comes over time, right? It, it comes um, with experience like, like many things. Uh, self-confidence um, in, in yourself and your ability to kind of manage the group, even self-confidence, um, I have on there also comfort with content, your confidence in your ability to deliver certain content, um, maybe the topics that you're meant to cover in your program or uh, the lesson plans and activities and things that you planned for the day. Um, you may have you know, sometimes you get a curricula and the instructions are really confusing and that can kind of take a blow uh, in your into your self-confidence. Um, but, you know, trying to find the, the way that you want to do an activity or the adaptations that you need to make, um, again, comes with that experience piece. 
um, the number of years someone's been working with young people and, um, and all of that really shapes how they uh, connect with youth, the little tips and tricks that they've picked up um, over time can, uh, can really shape how they approach their work. And then the, the last piece there is comfort with youth um, and how, how the educator or facilitator views youth. Um, if you've ever seen someone teach or, or lead a program that uh, has a negative view of youth, um, their sessions with youth, youth might be required to attend them for some reason, but, um, but they don't necessarily like it or they may not be uh, happy with having to participate in programming where they're viewed negatively. Young people always, um, you know, as they move through the world, they're often seen in a negative light, right? Those people that haven't uh, uh, adopted the positive youth development kind of approaches and, and strengths-based program um, approaches um, really struggle to create connection with youth uh, frequently. Um, and, you know, even folks that have a little bit less experience that are maybe facilitating uh, with youth for the first time, maybe a little bit intimidated by, uh, by them um, because there's just a lack of familiarity there that that's hard. Um, I, another piece that I've heard from, um, from educators and facilitators is being from a different culture, especially if you're working with native youth and um, you're not native yourself or not indigenous yourself, uh, there can be sort of a little bit of self-confidence um, kind of challenge in, am I the right person to be leading a program for native youth or am I the right person to be delivering these messages? Um, and, you know, you're the person that's there that day. And, and if you can focus on uh, being, uh, trying to approach your work with thoughtfulness, with intentionality, and still creating an affirming cultural space um, for the youth that you're working with, um, then I think you're the right person, right? Doesn't mean that there's uh, not an opportunity for inviting some guest speakers or inviting your uh, cultural, you know, department to come help bring some of those cultural messaging in that you might feel challenged by um, because you're not from the same culture. Um, it's it's important to recognize that you can still be um, a positive um, adult for young people, even if you don't share culture, even if that's a an aspect that you're worried about. You can still be a positive person uh, in their lives and help them connect with their own culture um, through guest speakers, through inviting uh, food, you know, uh, food op opportunities or inviting your cultural department. If you work for a tribe, um, there's lots of ways that you can bring in uh, some of those elements that you might feel like you're lacking uh, yourself. But yeah, happy to yeah. Nicole, that's a really um, awesome point, an important point, and a very real point, you know, of having many of our non-Native, uh, you know, community members or, um, you know, professionals uh, where the, in reservation communities are in a setting, and it's like the, it's, um, you know, and, and, and you have a multicultural setting, you know, so, um, yeah, it's, it's not easy. But you know what, um, I think, again, it's really a wonderful opportunity to be able to work together uh, mm -hmm. um, in a supportive way, in a learning way where everybody learns. And I'll just make a shameless little plug for one of our community of practices, how to be a good ally if you're a non-native working in reservation communities. There's a community of practice session on that. Very, very well done. So thanks for bringing that. And I know there's some mm -hmm. folks that definitely appreciated you bringing up this point. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, Hannah in the chat says um, youth that that maybe turn their lives around um, and then it's hard for them to get that trust back because um, they're, they're always getting judged. That's so frequent, right? And part of the challenge is, you know, sometimes young people have uh, done some really harmful things. They may have even done harmful things things to you um, personally or said harmful things to you that that hurt your feelings. Um, 
And, and it's really tough because we're, de we're interacting with young people that are constantly growing and changing. I know I wouldn't want to be judged forever by the way I acted when I was 13. Even at 14, I didn't want to be judged by the way that I was acting at 13. Um, and so, you know, as hard as it can be for us to remind ourselves this is an evolving person and who they've been even yesterday or two weeks ago um, is not the person that you're seeing today. Um, letting young people be new and be different and giving them space um, to, to grow and change is part of how we um, continue to be a person that is positive, right? The people that let young people do that um, are the beloved educators, the beloved youth program leaders, um, because they don't take things um, so personally that they can't let young people be a new and different person um, from one day to the next. So I would love to hear um, from uh, from others in the chat box, um, what other facilitator characteristics help uh, create a, a safe space? And again, that can be, yeah, good, good adaptation there, Michelle. Uh, educator characteristics, clinic staff uh, characteristics, youth advisor, youth leader um, characteristics. What are some uh, things that you as an adult um, can can exhibit that help create a safe space. Humility. Oh, I love that, Michelle. To me, humility is one of the biggest uh, things that uh, that educators can do to um, to be, you know, uh, the type of person that um, a, a facilitator. Uh, the type of person that a young person wants to interact with or uh, engage with and learn from. Good listening skills, empathy, listening, understanding, trauma-informed services, right? Pushing ourselves to, um, to continue evolving and, and growing. Um, present uh, at the moment and engaged. Oh, that's such a good one, Dana. Um, I... Always uh, one of my big tips that I tell people is, you know, you can be having a terrible day, right? And still have to deliver your youth program that day or, or be present for um, an educational program that day. But, um, but trying, trying to um, take a deep breath, kind of center yourself and let go of whatever's shaping your day that's not so positive and just try to be kind of in the here and now with, uh, with a young person. Having comfortable and approachable entire attire. Yeah, I'm an artsy person. So I pay attention to the wardrobe. Yes, the, the wardrobe that we wear um, really can give a signal to how relaxed we feel or how comfortable we are um, being with young people. Meeting them at their own uh, at their own level, right? Uh, Native communities are all about laughter and having fun with each other. Build that rapport with them while having fun. Thanks, Kashmir. Yeah, humor is such an important element, right? Um, being able to uh, laugh and have fun and not take yourself even too seriously are really um, important uh, important aspects. Moving at the speed of trust, especially with sexual health conversations, yeah, um, it's it's helpful to be be thoughtful about the trust that you're uh, cultivating with young people. Adaptable to conversations, reading some of the nonverbals, uh, some hidden skills, yeah. Being mindful about language, even those uh, words that have been normalized in everyday speech but might have harmful origins, right? A big, big uh, one that I always come back to is um, that people so frequently say is uh, divide and conquer. And I know I'm probably guilty of saying this uh, from time to time too, but um, in particular, that's the strategy um, of colonization, right? Uh, the strategy to specifically break down uh, native communities. So it's important that we are mindful of, of some of those things. 
All right, the screen blacked out for some reason. Okay, good. Can you see? Mm -hmm. see? Okay, good. Thanks. Classroom management do. Yeah. So some, uh, as we think about classroom management, um, some do's, some things to, to try to do, um, prioritizing, strengthening uh, relationships with youth um, and between youth really has one of the biggest impacts, right? The ways that you can create opportunities for them to connect with one another, to um, learn more about each other and, and feel bonded as a group, as well as bonding with them individually yourself, um, goes so far in, um, in shaping the dynamic within your youth group or within your classroom. Um, it's, it's so important, right? We are um, often will avoid saying something harmful or doing something harmful to someone we love and care about, right? Um, and so creating that, um, that connection between yourselves and, and the group that you're working with as well as their connections with each other is, is really important. Uh, creating uh, youth ownership of programming um, and for the group environment, a, a big reason why we ask young people to contribute to group agreements is that it does create that ownership. It's not your rules that you're asking them to follow. It's their rules that they've said uh, to each other that they'll follow. Um, so really important um, to think about those ways that you can create um, ownership over the programming. That might also look like, um, you know, giving them opportunities to guide uh, the, the lesson of the day, letting them bring in a cultural element to share at the beginning of the program to, um, to create that opportunity for them to share culture with each other. Uh, reinforcing youth strengths, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, creating opportunities where you're, um, you know, showing praise, showing uh, positive reactions for the things that they're doing well, the, the things that they're contributing positively uh, to the group, providing regular praise. Um, there, there's uh, some folks that maybe feel like we praise young people uh, too often. I, I don't mean don't ever hold them accountable, um, but I do mean when they do something well or that they've shared, um, that you let them know that you're glad that they did. Um, or uh, thank them for, for their contribution to the group. Those things keep people um, contributing to the group and keeping up with the, the sharing. Uh, the use of the physical space of the room is another tip that, that I share frequently. Um, if you um, only stand at the front of the room and only, you know, sort of lead uh, from the top of the classroom, you may miss some, um, some things going on in the back of the class that's either really good comments or good, good contributions. Um, and, and maybe you get the best out of the youth at the, at the front of the class, but uh, don't feel like you get any any participation from youth at the back of the class. Um, it's really important to recognize that we're often what shapes that dynamic, right? Um, our ability to move around the room as much as um, the way that we lay out the room, um, it's much easier to move around a circle than to try to get back to a, a back of a crowded uh, classroom that's got too many desks in it. Um, so the way we use the room and the use of our own body throughout the room um, is a really important aspect of um, how we can manage the class or the group uh, dynamic in a more positive way. And you'll often see that when you start asking questions while you're um, in, in one part of the room, you get the most participation from the people in that part of the room. So that's why using the full space that you have available to you um, is really important. Um, and then using a variety of learning methods. So um, regardless of whatever your curricula says or uh, what your lesson plan might say for the day, um, always be thinking about, am I creating opportunities for solo reflection, for small group interactions, for large group interactions, um, for, you know, activities or worksheets, um, youth presentations or sharing, 
um, art, you know, kind of activities or creative kind of activities. So using a variety of uh, learning methods or group facilitation methods can go a long way. Um, you'll often discover that the young people that are maybe your artist type um, may also be young people that don't don't necessarily know what to say in a large group, um, but they can create a beautiful, um, beautiful imagery or a, you know, a poster presentation that uh, teaches in a way that is, is, you know, much, much greater than what you can do on your own just speaking um, to the full group. So creating those spaces, um, different ways that uh, young people can interact and, and engage in your programming creates an opportunity for them to um, uh, just engage in the ways that they feel most comfortable. Okay, oh, we can go on to the next one. Go I ahead. love that. I just wanted to let you know, you hear us often with the We Are Native family and Healthy Native, you know, we always say like, you know, anybody willing to take a healthy risk, you know, mm -hmm. get outside your comfort zone and, you know, incentives are incredibly popular and always encouraged. Um, you know, uh, we want to affirm our youth and we know of one outstanding native stand educator in Arizona who, um, used to give out tickets, um, literally called doing something awesome, you know, and you compile a certain amount of those tickets and, you know, there'd be an incentive, um, you know, it could be a movie ticket. It could be a little something for the snack bar at school. It could be when we have our We Are Native gear store open, you mm -hmm. know, like a cool fanny pack or a shirt, you know, something that really can go a long way in not only youth engagement and growth contribution, but recruitment and retention. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you got kids that want to join your class or want to go to the clinic or, right. you know, um, it's, it has a lot of possibilities. So thank you for that. Yeah, for sure. Great, great point, Michelle. I always remember during early on in the pandemic, one of our, we are native educators in Michigan, um, did, uh, we are native masks, right? Like custom masks that, uh, they had made for, for youth and, um, man, kids were coming out of the woodwork trying to figure out where do I get one of these We Are Native masks um, because the logo is cool and it, it just um, sparks kind of cultural pride in a time when literally like half our faces um, was erased, right? And so, um, yeah, I love incentives, love um, ways that we can help you um, sort of recognize uh, some good good things that they're putting out into the world and let them know that we appreciate it, that we see it, we notice it, um, even as lots of times they're being noticed for what they're not doing well or what they're not, uh, you know, contributing in a positive way. But every young person has strengths. Uh, the more that we can support them and, and honor those strengths, the better. So some don'ts, um, I, I try to avoid negative language to a certain extent, but um, but I think it's important to think about what not to do as well. Um, try try your hardest not to do language that harm that harms, right? Um, you don't want to um, use your speech to be shaming or reinforce stigma or things that we already know um, Native youth are, are getting enough of, right, um, in their uh, just lived experience as, as young people. Um, we don't want to use non-inclusive language or language that um, sort of makes light of other people's uh, struggles or things like that. Um, and we also want to make sure that when we see those, uh, that kind of language coming from other youth in our program, uh, that we address it. Young people have shared with me that, you know, oh, that all these, you know, teachers in our school have, um, you know, sort of the safe space sticker, but then they hear bullying or they hear um, anti-LGBTQ, you know, uh, language and they never say anything. Um, and it's really, really harmful. It lets me know that regardless of what the sticker on their door says, that's not a safe space for me to be myself. And so being really mindful um, and also being willing to have young people kind of teach you when, when you have done this, right? Um, let them know that, um, you know, if there's ever anything that you say or, or do that 
uh, that they find harmful or that they find, you know, um, isn't, isn't very supportive for them, that you're willing to take that feedback and listen and be corrected. Um, we all make mistakes as part of demonstrating that, uh, that we make mistakes um, and, and that's a normal part of life. But um, if we're willing to hear feedback and do better and, and be our best selves um, and try every day to kind of do, do what's um, supportive to others and beneficial for, for the entire group, that that's a good thing, right? Um, so being willing to apologize um, when you've made a mistake or when you haven't been, maybe you've had a bad day or you overreacted or you did something wrong, um, you know, being being able to apologize uh, shows humility and it also um, shows young people that you're a human being too, that you don't expect perfection from them. You, you expect that we're all open to learning and growing together. And along with that, um, being willing to, you know, not take things too personally, um, not not overreact, you know, or see it as an indictment of, you know, young people's uh, lack of respect for you just because they didn't um, didn't do their best on any given day, right? Try to again let them be a new person each day, and um, you know, be be ever evolving. Um, but part of that is is you showing that you're also willing to. Uh, be open and learn and grow with them. All right, so I'd love to hear in the chat box, um, what's your, your top classroom management tip? So uh, one of mine, and I'll share uh, share what it is in just a sec. Um, there's a saying in strategic planning that goes, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and it means that the culture within an organization uh, can often override the most carefully thought out strategic plan or strategy um, that just the inherent sort of culture of a, of a organization can um, be the, the linchpin in, in, you know, a strategy being successful or not. Um, so in classroom management, we could adapt that uh, to uh, a saying uh, a saying like that, um, that structure eats content for breakfast. Um, so the way that we structure our time with youth um, and the consistency of that structure is really foundational uh, to managing our classroom and youth groups effectively. All right, Ben says, uh, strengths-based approach, uh, focusing on a person's or group's positive attributes. And that's especially true um, for Native youth, right, that that um, don't see their culture represented very frequently in mainstream media, but um, but should, should be seen for uh, the strength that their community um, and, and that their ancestors have brought to the equation. Nicole says, uh, being willing to adapt and be flexible to uh, what best fits the needs of youth that day. That's so important, Nicole. Um, you know, any of you that have experienced, say, something that's happened on a community level, maybe a tragedy that's happened or a uh, violent, you know, uh, activity that's happened in, in your community knows it's really hard to move on from that and we shouldn't just move on from it. A young person once said to me, you know, all the adults are acting like everything's okay. This is during COVID, that everything's okay and that we're back at school, so everything's fine. And we know everything is not fine, so stop saying it's fine. Um, when we try to gloss over um, what's happened, what's affecting young people, um, we aren't honoring how it's affecting them and that the feelings that they're feeling are really important and the, they're really the most important thing uh, that's happening that day. So our lesson plan or our activity plan for that day um, needs to sometimes take a back seat to caring for our community and caring for our young people when they're going through something tough. Um, sending that message helps young people tap into um, recognizing when they're feeling things, uh, normalizing that mentioning them and talking about them and processing through those emotions are really, really important. So thanks for that, Nicole. Uh, timing your class and um, 
appointment with you. So be mindful of the time of day. Yeah, a.m. or p.m., right? Uh, yeah, if you're trying to lead a program at, at 9 a.m. for youth, just know that their brains aren't going to be fully on board, um, you know, so that's going to be more of a need to ease into the day kind of thing. Dream big and I'm going to steal all of your ideals. Yeah, I love that, Hannah. And Clover says, being specific about the tone of the space and asking students about their comfortability in uh, conversation and discussion. Yeah, and being willing to um, adapt to whatever's going to meet, meet their needs a little bit more um, effectively. Jackie says, consistency, agree. Um, and then naming students by name uh, that they would like for me to use uh, for them, even on the first day that we meet. Um, so I struggle with names and uh, I have uh, name tags for everyone and myself on the first day until I learn everyone's name. Um, and then ensuring that students are also learning each other's names with icebreakers. And part of the way that they learn that, right, through team builders, icebreakers, games, um, that those are all really important. But part of how they learn it is hearing you say it on a frequent basis. I love the idea of name tags. It also gives us an opportunity to add pronouns as well. All right, so um, so as we think about structure, um, like I said, the structure kind of eats the content for breakfast. The structure of our program uh, shapes so much about um, how well it's going to go. Let's go to the next one. <clears throat> So I always think of, um, I was having a, an educator, I, so I, because I'm a consultant and I work with lots of teams um, across the US, um, I, I work with lots of health educators that lead health programs for youth. So I had an educator a while back that was really struggling with getting youth focused and on task during, uh, during her lessons. And I was like, oh, talk me through how you start the day. And she said, well, I just start the way the activity is written. And I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> but her session was immediately following lunch. So they've just come from a really social um, environment. And they might need a little bit of time kind of coming out of that social environment and, and engaging. Or if youth are coming directly from school where they haven't been able to be um, social, you know, because they've been in class a lot, uh, they might need the, those few minutes as they transition in to just decompress, uh, you know, maybe have a snack. Um, but really part of that is we should see it as being prepared to learn. So the arrival process and kind of coming together doesn't mean that you it has to be totally unstructured, right? It can be like, you know, maybe your question of the day, um, you know, that, that you ask how they're doing. Um, a young person once uh, told me that their favorite thing their teacher did was start each session with a quote, right? Native Stand starts that way as well uh, with the words of wisdom for the day. Um, and, and it kind of shapes with a cultural teaching right out the gates um, of something positive. Um, but the young person said, it shows that every day my teacher is thinking of like, what's something positive she can share to start our day together. And I love that, right? It's such a beautiful thing to communicate to young people uh, that you've been thoughtful or intentional about how to start your day. And then the, you know, uh, you know, introducing the session, giving giving young people a heads up about what the content's going to be, uh, what the expectation is for the day, um, and maybe including a, an opportunity for cultural teaching there or centering the group um, on whatever the focus of the day is going to be. So after you shift from just the general kind of arrival time, um, setting up the day gives young people a, an idea of what's going to be discussed. This is also a really important trauma-informed strategy, too, um, because if a young person, say the alcohol, alcohol and drugs is the topic of the day, if a young person is struggling with that topic because alcohol and drugs is a regular, you know, aspect of um, their home environment, or maybe their, their brother is addicted uh, to a, a substance or something, or they've seen a parent struggle with substance abuse, um, and, you know, 
they they're going to struggle with that topic, right? It may be a little too uh, too personal for them. Giving them that heads up about what you're going to talk about or what's going to be covered. And also maybe giving a reminder of, don't forget we've got, you know, I know that topic can be tough uh, for some, but um, if you need a little space, feel free to uh, take take a moment in our, you know, relaxation den or whatever, whatever you come up with for what the uh, space is that young people can go if they need to step out of an activity um, is really important. And then uh, closing uh, your session each each time, sometimes we run up into the end of, of our time uh, with young people um, and uh, we have to rapidly close, right? But being sure to close is, is a really important time as well, giving them um, an opportunity to say, reflect on what they've learned, an opportunity to connect with each other personally, um, or hear from each other uh, one last time and transition out of programming lets them move on to what comes next um, in a positive way. Maybe you give them a lovely blessing like we do as, as part of our ending um, and beginning time. So um, those, those opportunities um, give you a, a good, good way to structure a program uh, that helps create a consistent, predictable routine. And so the final piece, um, what, how do the youth characteristics, the youth, uh, what they bring to the equation shape the learning environment? And we'll uh, go ahead and start adding some thoughts and ideas to the chat box, but let's go on to the next slide. I'm just gonna briefly touch on, um, on, um, ah, there we go. Uh, so one one thing that a young person shared with me at, at one point was this lovely quote, uh, teach us how to think, not what to think. Young people want these opportunities to explore their own thoughts, ideas, um, and, and um, perspectives. And so teaching them how to uh, set boundaries for themselves and things um, go a long way. So um, I'm not going to cover the the activity because we're I know we're getting a little close on time but um, but this is a good practice for you in thinking about how you demonstrate uh, so take a look at the slides after um, but practice setting a healthy boundary or a personal rule for yourself um, at work so maybe an example um, might be, you know, I will not discuss my behavior as a team uh, with the young people uh, that I work with. Maybe that's a boundary that you need to hold for yourself or a boundary at work um, might be, I, I will not work past 6 p.m., you know, to try to prioritize family time. All right, let's go on to the next. So in Native It's Your Game uh, uses these really lovely, um, as we think about helping young people set boundaries uh, for themselves, um, Native It's Your Game uses this lovely framework of select, detect, and protect. Um, so selecting a personal rule or a boundary, um, looking for opportunities to, uh, or did, what might signal you when you're, um, your boundary or your personal rule is being challenged? And then how do you protect your personal rule or boundary um, when it's being challenged? So that's a little framework. Uh, check out Native It's Your Game um, in our curricula uh, page on, on Healthy Native Youth um, for a little more insight into that framework. It's a lovely way to teach young people about boundaries. When I think about um, helping young people set their own boundaries and, and uh, select what's right for them, uh, three things come to mind. Um, so connecting to their support network that they have available, offering a range of options, and then in making sure to invite parents uh, into the process because parents are such an important um, aspect of, of young people's lives. And that can be parents, caregivers, um, whoever's at home that, that cares for young people.
So um, key to, to this, you know, young people should know um, who the peers and adults in their lives are. Um, so creating activities or opportunities for them to um, explore who those people are that are supportive people for them um, is a big part in who they can talk to when they're trying to identify what's right for them, what boundaries they want to set for themselves. Um, and important to that as well is also a backup plan and emergency support. If things go wildly, you know, uh, unlike you anticipated, uh, who do you call for help? Um, do your parents want to be called uh, if you end up in trouble? The answer is probably yes. Uh, they want they want to come rescue you, even though they might be mad that you snuck out to a party. Uh, the point is they'll come get you if you end up in a bad situation. Um, help young people build their skills for negotiation, help them practice that with their friends, um, you know, for negotiation, refusal, as well as rapid exits, right? What are their exit strategies that they can exercise? And then uh, teach young people to accept no for an answer. As important as it is to teach boundaries, young people also need to know how to hear a no and accept it. And sorry to rush through the end here. Um, some other um, other options that are some a way to give young people a sense for the range of options so that we're not teaching them what to think, but teaching them how to think um, is giving them, um, you know, a sense for the fact that it's their right to to choose what's right for them, but giving them a range of options. So some people um, may feel this way. Other people may want to do this or set this boundary for themselves. Ultimately, you have to decide what's right for you. And then importantly, don't leave uh, parents out of the process. So um, parents sometimes need a little bit of support um, to identify ways that um, you know, tips or resources or information, such as our text messaging line um, that we have for, for parents and caregivers. Um, let, let parents know, you know, some ways that they can approach conversations, but also what you're going to be covering in your program uh, so they understand um, what, what topics are being covered and how to talk about them. Uh, provide opportunities for youth to connect with their parents, like homework discussions. Um, Native It's Your Game has a really nice, um, nice one there in lesson three. Um, so starting with, you know, helping young people talk to their or interview their their parents about uh, friendships and, you know, did they have a really good friend uh, when they were little or when they were young, when they were teenagers, um, as a way to kind of create a connection to a personal rule um, for themselves. So lots of lots of resources available on the Healthy Native Youth uh, site uh, for you to take a look at. That's another one from Native It's Your Game. But those homework opportunities, um, you know, are, are great opportunities for parents to get involved in the process and uh, to give them a little bit of uh, structure to how they can connect uh, with their young people about um, the topics that you're covering. So that's all I have for today, but would love additional thoughts and, and ideas in the uh, chat box if folks have, have some time there. That is fantastic, Nicole. Mm -hmm. And I just thank you so much for that. I, I really, of course, we lean a lot on the chat feed if folks want to also to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Love to... Uh, get your thoughts, your feedbacks, your suggestions, maybe even how this may have give you some ideas. Um, we certainly do have a, a lot of resources, but what was helpful or anything you still want to know about? Well, I do know that was a lot of information to throw at, but all good information. So people are marinating and uh, taking it all in and um, just want to let you all know that following up to this presentation today on the Healthy Native Youth uh, website, we will um, 
be posting the recording of this video in addition to the two lovely handouts that Nicole talked about, the um, youth uh, uh, sample agenda, um, as well as the Native It's Your Game take home activities. Uh, we do follow up with um, making sure that you have some uh, tools to take it back home. And um, so that's what we like to do here at Healthy Native Youth. So thank you so much, Nicole. And I'm seeing all the lovely love in the chat feed for you all. Great info, new to this position, really appreciate it. Um, I'm so grateful for all the folks that are with us today. Just want to take a few moments and please keep your comments coming in. Healthy Native Youth, you know, is a one-stop shop educator portal uh, for those who engage youth. And as you will see here, we have plenty of tools. And one of my famous taglines is go there, healthynativeyouth.org, get lost in it. We've got an implementation toolbox to help you if you're thinking about an adolescent health plan in your community. We have uh, a comparison of curricula tool to see what might best fit your community or your health categories that you're looking at. As you saw, standalone lessons, tools for caring adults. And of course, we here love to come together and know what's going on out there in the field. So community of practice every second uh, Wednesday of the month. Ah, for youth, this is a great website right now, getting to the end of the holidays before you start sending youth home or you're going to see them over the holiday. Make sure you have them bookmark wearenative.org. This is our multimedia health resource for Native youth, by Native youth. One of our famous uh, Q&A services is Ask Your Relative. I encourage your youth to sign up for text native to 9449. And of course, follow us on our social media challenge uh, calendars. As Nicole mentioned about being an askable youth, uh, or an adult, sometimes they may not always go to adult. They like to go on their phone. So this is the place for them to take a look privately, discreetly, and get kind of that native WebMD information for them uh, around various health topics. I know our lovely sisters to the north, Miss Hannah and uh, Fiends Edwards from Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium are on this call. For all of you who are in Alaska, and I know there's some of you, uh, I know mine.org is a fantastic website. If you don't know about it, get with the program. Take a look and see these folks. Uh, the website you'll see here, again, it has the same interface for uh, health information for youth, young adults, even adults, and they have a, a very similar Ask Nurse Lisa Q&A and has an outstanding order shop that you need to take a look. So I encourage you to take a look. And I think Fiends and uh, Hannah put their contact information in there, so get to know them. Ah. Uh, I see our Washington state folks are on here, but we have a Washington Youth Sexual Health Project called WISH here uh, that was coordinated out of the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. Remember Nicole was talking about what you can do to make your space a little warm, a little more welcoming. This is a wonderful um, uh, way to just give it a start. The Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board has social marketing campaigns of all different types and this is our safe spaces, get yourself tested uh, materials for tribal clinics and classrooms, boys and girls clubs to affirm our environment for our two-spirit LGBTQ relatives. So take a look. Look at that darn cute Zoom background image. Um, all kinds of fun stuff. Remember, uh, that first impression is very important for anyone. And if folks can identify and just see a little something that is intriguing or makes them feel warm and comforting, Go for it. And the best yet, it's all free. This is our youth support resources document. One of my personal faves. If you were anywhere in community, you should download this document. You can get it on the Healthy Native Youth link tree. We are native, thrive, any of our websites. This is excellent to hand out for youth. Caring adults should have it. It should be printed and laminated and put into your bathrooms boys and girls clubs, kitchens, schools, dorms, clinics. As you can see here, it shows all a variety of different health topics here with resources for phone numbers, websites, 
text messaging campaigns, you name it, we got it on here. And adapt it and make it your own, localize it. This is very important, especially around the holiday season and the breaks. Here you go right here. Here's a QR code, take a little snapshot there, but the link tree for Thrive, we also have one for Healthy Native Youth. But again, this is very important, especially around this winter time and all year around, suicide prevention and intervention tools we love to share. One of my favorites, talking is power. As Nicole talked about, you know, we have a lot of sensitive topics on the mind of our young people. And how can we, as those caring adults and parents and relatives, be there uh, to grab that moment to have these conversations? Talking is Power helps to be able to give you weekly tips if you text the word EMPOWER to 9449 to help get the conversation started, to find a little bit more about how we can have those warm, welcoming conversations. Mind for Health is an online mental health uh, resource lifting up and destigmatizing the topics around mental health, but really giving skill building uh, videos and links to helpful caring adults to talk with youth about their mental health. This is a really awesome folks. This is an online training you can do on Healthy Native Youth, one hour, or just start simply by texting Mind for Health to 65664. We're wrapping it up here. Join Healthy Native Youth. We love when anybody signs up for a newsletter, we get to see uh, who signs up. We have a monthly newsletter that provides updates on curricula, our toolbox tool featuring a text message campaign. You can follow us on our social medias or you can text the word healthy to 9449 and we'll give you some information. But this is our famous link tree. So uh, take a look at that. We take a lot of pride in our resources. Lovely Taylor Dean did this wonderful flyer here, our wonderful artwork here that just captures the beauty of this part two series that Nicole so kindly and brilliantly kicked off today, Safe Spaces 101. Please sign up. Registration is live. Our next session will be January 10th. Very popular, Two-Spirit LGBTQ Plus 101. Come hear about how we can build strong communities that are inclusive within our two-spirit LGBTQ youth health programs, but also too, we as adults and allies and accomplices to our diverse relatives, how can we be more inclusive and how can we be more safe and welcoming as one? We love helping. So take a look at Healthy Native Youth's website. We got technical assistance links. You can give us feedback. How did we do today? Um, aside from my technical difficulties. But um, we love to like know what you're thinking, how you might need some help. Maybe we can guide you towards a curricula or we could just say, hey, come and join us. And um, you're not alone. We've got folks just like you who are facing the same challenges or they've got success stories and best practices. And this is our lovely Project Red Talon Regional Partner Network. We don't do this by ourselves. We coordinate under the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, but we have folks out of Alaska, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, John Hopkins Center for Indigenous Health, University of Texas School of Public Health, Intertribal Council of Arizona, love those folks, Southern Plains Tribal Health Board, and of course, Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. And we are known as Project Red Talon Regional Partner Network. We owe a great deal of gratitude to our funders, the Indian Health Service, HIV and Behavioral Health Programs. It's also supported by the Secretary Minority AIDS Initiative Fund. Thank you so much to our funders, but really thank you, each and every one of you, for what you do to help raise healthy Native youth. And at this time, I'd like to be able to uh, take a few moments and um, would just like to offer a closing on this uh, last day of our community of practice for the calendar year 2023. So with that, feel free to uh, close your eyes or just uh, take a moment. And I'd like to offer these words. <laughs> God, we'd just like to thank you for this time, for all of these wonderful human beings to come together on this day 
to be able to hear the good words that were shared about how we can help one another, help our communities, help our families, help our caring adults, and most importantly, help our youth. We just thank you for this wonderful time and for this year that we've come together to be able to lift each other up, one another, in order to be able to take on the challenges that are facing us in our communities. However, we know with those challenges comes opportunities. As we look at this winter time now of this time of sharing stories and lessons we're learning for our youth, we appreciate the space that's been offered for us to learn from each other as we look to the next season in a new year and coming forward here at this time. We ask that you watch over all of us as we part from here and all those who could not be with us here. We just ask that you watch over them, watch over our families, our loved ones, and that for those who may be wandering, who may be hurting, who may be lost, we just ask that they open their mind and their heart to know that there is healing, that there is hope, and that together through you, creator, and all of us here, and those who came before us, our ancestors, and the youth that are of today that are our hope for tomorrow and those to come, that we will springboard to another day tomorrow and into the new year and to carry forward together as one. We thank you on this day. Thank you so much, everyone. We hope you have a beautiful and blessed day.